In searching for wholeness, we are attempting to figure out ways that we can better live out, better grow up into the Jesus life juntos. All right? If we're not, if we're not paying attention to our own selves and, and what we're wrestling with, then it's going to be difficult for us to effectively serve others. If, if we're not taking the time to acknowledge our own brokenness and hurt and, and pain and, and begin to find healing for that, it's going to be really difficult for you and for me to help someone else find the hope and healing that they need. Because what happens is that some of us, we become a little disgruntled with Jesus because we're not experiencing the wholeness the way that we thought we could or should. And some of that is quite simply is because Jesus started leading us on a journey and pointing out some things that were less obvious to us, and we were uncomfortable with letting him change that. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, I know that some of you have grown up with an understanding of a certain game as being prohibited, particularly among church folk. Right? Some of you grew up in a, in a church tradition where the idea of playing a game with a deck of cards was problematic. Where the idea of, of having you know, uh, cards with kings and queens and jacks on there was against your religion. Now, others of you, you didn't know that there was ever such a prohibition. And some of you grew up playing a particular game that you thought everybody played and everybody knew how to play it. Some, it's not just that, maybe they can play with cards, they just can't play this type of game because this type of game involves wagering. Poker. Poker is, a, is, is, a, is an interesting game that, that, you know, at different times in our lives, some of us have experimented with it and some of us have gotten caught up in it where we just can't seem to do anything else but play it and we're you know, giving away lots and lots of M&Ms. Because that's the only way you should play poker is with M&Ms, right? You shouldn't, shouldn't give away your money because that would seem crazy unless you're the winner, right? But, uh, you know, there, there's a dynamic in which poker can be problematic because if you're spending money you don't have, so that way you can win the money at the end of the day, you have, you have set yourself up for failure, right? If you're, if you're engaged in, in something like poker or the lottery or any other form of gambling, and you expect that you're going to be engaged in it merely so that you can increase your wealth, please do us a favor and stop doing that. You're putting yourself in a very dangerous position. But if you recognize that this is just money that you're willing to blow away, say goodbye to, and you can afford to say goodbye to it, you can afford to say goodbye to it, I don't know about you, but today I, I can't afford to say goodbye to much anything. I'm not even sure I can afford to say goodbye to M&Ms. <laughs> you see, many of us get caught up in it, but it's an interesting game. And, and what happens is some people, especially when they're new to poker, all they do is they fixate on their cards. They look at their cards and they try and figure out what combination that they have. Do they have two of a kind, three of a kind? Do they have a full house? Do they have, you know, a straight? And they're like trying to figure And all they do is just look at their four, five, six cards, whatever, seven cards, how many cards they're playing with. And they, and they try and figure out the possibilities of what they can do with their cards. And they forget that there are a total of 52 cards in the deck. And that there are multiple combinations that could be happening, not only in their potential hand, but also in the hands of the other people that are playing. And there are some things that they can observe and some things that they cannot fully see. There are some things that it takes experience to catch on to, and there are other things that it's just kind of an intuition. And then there's some people who are really smart and they do the math and they figure it all out. And the really, 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 really expert poker players understand that it's not just about what's in your hand. It's what's going on in the game. And I would say that the most obvious thing to pay attention to in poker is your hand. But if all you pay attention to is your hand, you will not be successful in the game. You will not be successful in the game. You will miss the opportunity. And some of you who are really good players, you know what I'm talking about. Because you know when to bluff and you know when to, somebody's bluffing and you know uh, the, the dynamics that are going on there. And, and, and you see more than the obvious. 
What if that's true in our lives? In this search for wholeness, we've been looking at hurts and hang-ups and habits. And many of us have some very obvious hurts. Our parents went through a divorce. That's an obvious hurt. We, 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 we had somebody close to us die at a significant place in our life. That's an obvious hurt. Some of us have some obvious hang-ups. It's like that person can't stand when somebody touches their neck. I don't know what's going on there, but that's, a, that's an obvious hang-up that they've got. Or, you know, they, they've got an obvious habit. You know, that person seems that they can't get away from the alcohol or they can't stop smoking or they can't stop cussing or whatever the, 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 the habit may be. They're obvious, and sometimes we over-fixate on the obvious. And because we over fixate on the obvious, we miss out on what today's focus is, which is step seven of we we miss out on letting the change work out by going deeper into our lives, deeper into our lives. What's obvious isn't always the problem. And that's difficult. But many of us only want the obvious changed. Many of us only want the obvious change, and so we step in the way of blocking any further change. It's like, I, I, I want to stop cussing. I don't want to deal with my anger. I, I want to stop drinking. I don't want to deal with my depression. I, 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 I want to I, I get my money in order. I don't want to deal with the reason that my money is out of order. And so many want the obvious change, but they stop the process when it comes to deep change. Maybe that's you. Maybe even that's been your Christian experience. You let Jesus save you from your obvious sins, but you didn't let him change your heart. And so you're still angry and you're still frustrated. You still treat your neighbor like they're less than human. You still yell and fight and carry on, but you got your ticket to heaven because that was obvious. And I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to think about the fact that that the reason that we're working through it is that there's much more going on here. And so like the phases of a clock, there are 12 steps that we're working through as we think about the process of change, as we think about what it's going to take for you and for me to change. It's kind of like working our way around the clock, and I think it's a helpful reminder because it takes time to change. Change doesn't happen overnight, and some moments will feel like they pass very quickly. Other moments will feel like they drag on and on and on. But interestingly enough, after you process through the 12 steps, you'll probably process through them again. Just like you process through 12 hours, you have to process through them again. We we want to do our part to remind you that, that the 12th step is really important. And a lot of times when you hear people talk about 12-step programs, they talk about step number one, admit that you have a problem, and that's where they focus. But 12, the 12th step is really important, and that is that we're responsible for carrying the message. And the research says that if we will carry the message, we're more likely to process all the 12 steps. But this is a quick review. I'm just going to hit these really fast, and then we're going to jump into Romans chapter 8. Step one through three is we admit that we have a problem, that We trust in Jesus and it begins to enable healing. We acknowledge that I can't, God can, so I'm going to let him. Those three steps right there, they just get us started. They're just the starting place. But most of us stop at step three believing that's enough. I can't, God can, so I'm going to let him. But it goes deeper. That's where we're moving to step four and five. Step four and five require some searching in our lives as we face ourselves without fear. And they require a bit of telling as we face others without fear and we admit what we have done. And in some sense, it it feels a little bit like it's borrowing from step one and two, but it's a bit different and deeper. And then step six is where we begin to face change in ways that are uncomfortable because we have to be willing to be changed. And then step seven is that we have to let the change work out. And let me just tell you, this is where the hard work is at. So look over in Romans chapter 8. And the reason that the hard work is here is because this is where it is incredibly uncomfortable. Most of us do not want this part of the journey. 
We want the easy part of the journey. We believe that growing into the Jesus life is something of comfort. But did you know that if you're going to grow muscle, it hurts? And growing into the Jesus life hurts. You remember when you were a kid and your legs started growing? And you'd be like, my legs hurt. You couldn't explain it. Some of you have, have kids and, and you watch them grow and they're like, my legs hurt. My feet hurt. My back hurts. It's because they're growing. Sometimes their feet hurt because they outgrew their shoes and they didn't even know it. And we got to do our part to, to help them understand it and work through it. And so Paul, the Apostle Paul, does his part to help us understand that there is an aspect to this Jesus life that maybe we're not comfortable with. Look over in Romans chapter 8, verse 18 through 25. Yet what we suffer. Can we just stop there, right there? Yet what we suffer. 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 Most of us don't want the suffer. We want the ease. But the transformation that you're looking for, the change that you believe that needs to happen in your life is a deeper change than you're ready for, and it will require a bit of discomfort and even suffering from you for it to come to pass. Let me finish reading the passage that Paul wrote for us. What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal later. And this is where many of us get mistaken is that we get caught up in the now and we lose sight of what's coming. And so because it's uncomfortable now, we quit rather than persevering through to the goal that is there. My goal in my life is to be fashioned and shaped by Jesus into whatever image he would have me be. And some days that's hard. Some days it's easy, but other days it can be hard. So back at 18, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly, waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal it for his, to his children really are. Against its will, all creation is, was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Perfect timing, Lilac, perfect timing. Come on, baby, cry. That childbirth right up into the present time. And as we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us the full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we had already had something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. We must wait patiently and confidently for God to finish the process. It's just like a pregnancy, just, a, you know, a, just as, as the way that we, we see a mother with a newborn. Paul is helping us to see that the pain is tied to the newness. We, we would love for you know, a pregnancy to have just like no discomfort. But most pregnancies have some sickness. Most pregnancies have some pain and stretching and growing that's associated with it. And then we haven't even gotten to the childbirth place yet. And as a man, I can't even speak about it. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, ye who have no children. All right. <laughs> but the point is, is the pain brings forth the newness. The pain, the suffering, the discomfort brings forth the newness, but too many of us are short-circuiting it, short-circuiting because we give up hope. We quit because it looks like it's going to be difficult. And if we are going to trust God to change us, we're going to have to let him work it out even in the discomfort. And I know we don't hear that message preached very often in churches because we want everybody to feel comfortable. But growing into the Jesus life 
is uncomfortable. The first time that you feel the Spirit of God tug on you to be generous beyond what you think is reasonable, that's going to be uncomfortable. When God tugs on you and he says, I need you to give this money for this purpose, you're going to be like, I don't know that I can do that. The first time that he, he calls you to slow yourself down and pay attention to the need of someone else, you're going to go, but I've got things I need to do. The first time that he holds up the mirror and it says, by the way, you talk about yourself a whole lot. Well, um, uh, I don't know what to say. Yeah, that's the point. It's going to be uncomfortable and painful. The first time that you hear him say, I need you to forgive. But God, they haven't asked for it. I didn't ask if they asked for forgiveness. I instructed you to forgive. That's going to hurt. And it's going to feel like it's unreasonable. And when you feel that unreasonableness coming in, don't argue with God through your reason. Ask God, are you sure? That's all you got to do. If you hear something and you're like, is that God speaking? Then you are allowed to say, are you sure? I know some of you are like, oh, I can actually question God. Yes. He's open to the conversation. He would rather have a conversation with you than for you to blindly just go about doing things like a robot. Afraid of him. He wants you to have the conversation that is one of friend to friend. Now, when you talk to God about some of these things, I don't want you to, to go at God like, you know, like you're the boss and, and be rebellious, but rather I want you to, to go to God and just say, I don't get it. I don't have to fully get it. I just need to know that I'm sure it's you. Kind of like pregnancy. The first baby, you don't fully get it. Right, mamas? I mean, it's like, I know I kind of, yeah, but, but when that baby is in your arms, when the hope is fulfilled, you get it. And that's true for mamas and daddies. When you hold that baby, it's like, oh, yes, now I understand. Because hope was fulfilled. And I want to encourage you and challenge you to think about that. Flip over into uh, Psalm chapter 39. Where is our hope? Where is it that you and I should place our hope? In Psalm 39, the psalmist is writing here, and verse 6 picks up and says, We are merely moving shadows, and all our busy rushing ends and nothing we heap up wealth, not knowing who will spend it. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? Where do I put my hope? My hope is only in you. Rescue me from my rebellion. Do not let fools mock me. I am silent before you. I won't say a word, for my punishment is from you, God. But please stop striking me. I'm exhausted by the blows of your hand. And when you discipline us for our sins, you consume us like a, a moth that is precious. Each of us is but a breath. You, you, you hear the psalmist kind of talking with God about the discomfort and the difficulty of it, but yet also that it's laced in hope. I don't understand all that's taking place, God, but my hope is in you. Help me not to rebel against you. You see, rebellion is impossible to deal with at times. Rebellion seems to overwhelm. It's kind of like when your child is arguing with you and you just want to pull your hair out and you don't know what to do. And I would just say as a parent who has had two get out of their teenage years, if you let them live, If you will let them live, it's not so bad. The rebellion isn't as bad as you think it is. And you just have to have the hope that they become adults. The hope that you can let them get there. But the reason that many of us struggle to actually have hope is because our view of God is wrong. Our view of God is inaccurate. Our view of God is limited. Jesus knew this, and that's why, and he's preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 9 through 11. He says this. He says, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people 
know how much to, how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? God, I'm asking you to change me. This feels really uncomfortable, but I asked you to change me. I'm going to trust you through it. I'm not going to rebel. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to throw up my hands and say I quit. I'm going to trust you through it because I understand that you're good. Our Heavenly Father exceeds the best examples that we have. Our Heavenly Father exceeds the best image that we can conjure up. Will we trust Him through that? Even in the difficulty, the discomfort, the suffering, the hardest moments of it, when it feels like nothing is coming together, when it feels like it's all falling apart. I, I, I mean, it, it can be so difficult, and, and that's why I love how Paul reminds the church. Paul reminds the church in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. He says, what shall we say about the wonderful things as God gives? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Romans 8, 31 and following. If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own choice? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us, pleading for us, working on our behalf. He's there for us. He's helping us. Who could be against us if God is for us? The reason that we give up, the reason that we fight, the reason that we abandon is because too oftentimes we don't really think that God is working for us. And so we don't allow God to go into the deep change that needs to happen in our lives. We want God to deal with the obvious, just what we can see in our own hands. We want God to face just the, the, the deal with the things that I can see. And God's like, no, 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 you don't understand. There's things that he sees. There are things that he wants to work on. There are things that he's needing to clean up in our lives that we're fighting on him. The obvious issue isn't the main issue. The change isn't just in the, the leaves. We've got a tree out front over here on, on the uh, Keys Boulevard. And it's green and it's got this dead branch right there. And the obvious thing is to just go in and cut out that dead branch. That seems obvious because it takes the brown out, makes it just green again. But that's not the real issue. The real issue is that tree, the soil is sitting too high on its roots and it's causing disease and decay to rise into it. And to help that tree takes more than just cutting off a dead branch. The obvious issue in your life isn't the main issue. There's more. So that addiction, that hurt, that hang up, that habit that you've got. God wants, to, God wants you to deal with that. Yeah, God's going to work with you in that. But he's going to dig deeper if you will let him. If you will trust him. He's a good God. He's faithful. He will clean you up. And so what we have to do is we have to engage in the prayer. The prayer that could look like this. It says, my creator... I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you remove from me every single defect, every single defect of my character, which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellow humans. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. There's a song by Natalie Grant. We're going to play it here. And, and I just want you to let this song just serve as a bit of a meditation for you over these next few moments. And as the song is played, if you feel the need to come forward and just 
bow at the, the prayer bench, then you can do that. It's available for you just to surrender yourself and just to say, God, I'm done fighting with you. I'm, I might ask, are you sure, but I'm not fighting with you. I may ask, are, are you certain, God, but I'm not fighting against you, God. I just need to know it's you. But he's the God who will take all of your brokenness and make it clean.